Isaiah 26, and we'll read a couple of verses there together. Isaiah 26, and we're going to read from verse 1 of that little chapter uh, there this morning. We're, we're going to be looking at uh, a wonderful promise that we find in this verse. And no matter what we're going through in life, this promise is, is a very important promise. And I know many of you will know this promise. And in your own life and in your own heart, you've maybe claimed this promise in many uh, different situations that you've been going through. So we'll take time uh, to read from verse 1 uh, down to the end of verse 13. Isaiah 26 and verse 1. Isaiah 26 and then verse 1. And it says, In that day shall this song be sung in the land of Judah. We have a strong city. Salvation will God appoint for walls and bulwarks. Open ye the gates that the righteous nation which keepeth the truth may enter in. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusted in thee. Trust ye in the Lord forever. For in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. For he bringeth down them that dwell on high the lofty city he layeth it low. He layeth it low even to the ground. He bringeth it even to the dust. The foot, shall, the, the foot shall tread it down, even the foot of the poor and the steps of the needy. The way of the just is uprightness. Thou most upright 
dost weigh the path of the just. Yea, in the way of thy judgments, O Lord, have we waited for thee. The desire of our soul is to thy name and to remembrance of thee. With my soul have I desired thee in the night. Yea, with my spirit within me will I seek thee early. For when thy judgments are in the earth, the inhabitants of the earth will learn righteousness. Let favor be showed to the wicked. Yet will ye he not learn righteousness. In the land of uprightness will he deal unjustly and will not behold the majesty of the Lord. Lord, when thy hand is lifted up, they will not see, but they shall see and be ashamed of their envy at the people. Yea, the fire of thine enemies shall devour them. Lord, thou wilt ordain peace for us, for thou also hast wrought all our works in us. O Lord our God, other lords beside thee have had dominion over us, but by thee only will we make mention of thy name. And we do thank the Lord for the reading of his precious word. We trust there'll be a blessing to us. A little later on, just we bring a few thoughts from that lovely uh, little portion of scripture together. Jesus, we just want to thank you for every head bowed here in your presence this morning. And we thank you, Lord, just for, the, as we said earlier, the privilege and desire just to gather. And we pray now, Lord, as we turn to your word, you tell us that your word shall not return unto you void. 
And Lord, we can read it here together in a tongue that we can read, we can understand. And we just pray, Lord, you lift your word up from its pages this morning and you'll drive it into our hearts afresh that it'll make a difference, it'll have a challenge, it'll have a purpose. And Lord, it'll have the privilege of seeing blessing just coming into our lives, into our hearts, and into our situations afresh. So Lord, take that word and just make it a help to us this morning because we ask it in your lovely name. Amen. Amen. Folks, if you have your Bibles with you, uh, turn with me there to Isaiah 26. And you'll see there very quickly that uh, in verse 3 is the little promise and the little thought that I want to look at this morning. Because this promise was given by God uh, to Israel in one of the darkest periods of Israel's history and in one of the darkest periods of, of Israel's life. And sometimes we come to these dark and difficult periods of life within our own hearts and with our own lives and within our own uh, situations. And it's lovely to have a word that will challenge but will also bless and will give us that assurance even as we go through the difficult times and the dark times that God is there and that God will not leave us and God will not forsake us. And sometimes even in the days we're going in, we know that spiritually speaking, as well as practically and physically, we can see that we are living in dark days. In a spiritual sense, the morality and the climate in our land today has gone away from God. And, and the climate of our land has turned to many other things. But, but the last little thought is the things of God and what God can give. And sometimes with that then comes in a difficulty and a doom and a gloom upon our land. We were looking there at the Bible study there a number of weeks ago at the, the 18th century. And the 18th century in our land was a very difficult time. It was a dark time. It was a gloomy time. And they said if, if it came along that Christianity as a whole and all to do with Christianity would be completely done away with. So that was the 18th century in our land. And then when we come into the, <coughs> excuse me, the 19th century, we read of revival and we read of a move of God and we realize there was a time of turning back to God. So in the times of gloom and doom, we also have to remember that God is in charge. We also have to remember that he is working out a plan and that he is working out a wonderful purpose in everything. So when we talk about the difficult times and the doom and gloom, remember that God is in charge. Remember that he knows and remember that he wonderfully cares. You know, the people in this day were surrounded by doom and gloom. They were surrounded by depression. And there was three things which mark out the, the children of Israel at this time. The first thing was fear. And we know that during the COVID time, that's what COVID brought with it, didn't it? It brought a real time of fear. Not knowing what tomorrow was going to bring. Not even knowing sometimes what that particular day was going to bring. And sometimes that fear continues on even in this present day. There also came a period of doubt. And you know, there's a great doubt towards the things of God today. You know, I remember reading a little quotation. I've used it many times, and I'm sure many of you will know it. Never doubt in the darkness what God has taught you in the light. And that's a wonderful thing. We can always trust God, because in the dark times and in the doubtful times, that's when we need God. And we can see him through those times. And the, the last little thought was, was worry or stress or anxiety. And the children of Israel were in the midst of worry. They were in the midst of stress. And they were in the midst of anxiety. And, and that was the difficulty in those days. And yet we can see that same difficulty today. Now when things are going well. And we don't have any problems or we don't have the trials and the difficulties. You could read down through this little portion of scripture and you could miss this wonderful promise. Or you could just take it as read and looked at. But you know, when the times of doubt come, when the times of fear comes, when, when the times of anxiety and that comes, folks, you'll read down through this and you'll pick out this lovely little promise because it is a tremendous promise. There in verse 3 it says, Thou wilt keep him, or can I say her, it's in the plural here, in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed upon thee because they trust in thee. And when the clouds, folks, of doubt, of disappointment, of trial, uh, alarm, anxiety drift in, it's wonderful to have this promise 
that God will keep us in perfect peace once our mind is stayed upon thee because we're trusting in him. Now, there's nothing to suggest in the scripture that we'll not have times of trial and trouble. One of the verses I, forgot, I never forget and I always use at this time is that man is born to trouble as the sparks fly upward. If you also go into Job, it says many are the afflictions of the righteous. So it's not that in life we don't go through our times of trial or trouble or tribulation. But in the midst of that trial, in the midst of that trouble, in the midst of that difficulty, God says to you and me as his child that he will keep us in perfect peace whose mind is stayed upon because we trust in him. In other words, outwardly, all can be completely going wrong. But inwardly, there's an inner peace. And sometimes for us, it's hard to understand. But that's the wonderful meaning of the promise here. Outwardly, everything can be going completely wrong. Or we've often used the word pear-shaped. But inwardly, there's a perfect peace in the midst of the storms of life. I was reading a commentary there during the week on this little thought. And it says, of what value would freedom from trouble be if we had no inner peace? That was the question was asked. And I thought how through that is. Because, you know, if there was no trouble outside and we hadn't got inner peace, would we be any better off? We wouldn't. Because no matter what the trouble is, it's the inward, it's the soul, it's the inner peace that truly counts for each and every individual. It's not the outward because the outward changes for us all from day to day. But that inner peace that we're going to look at this morning remains the same. It'll never change. Because he says, my peace I give unto you. You see, this is not a peace that the world gives. And the world cannot take it away. Because it's God's peace that's deep down within your heart and within my heart. It is a perfect peace described here. It's peace, peace. It's a double peace. And it's not wonderful this, this morning to realize that that double peace can come into our situation and it can be real within our hearts and within our lives. Edward Henry Bickersteth wrote a, a lovely hymn. And, and this is the hymn that came to my mind when I was looking at this, Peace, Perfect Peace. And some of you will know a peace, perfect peace in this dark world of sin. The blood of Jesus whispers peace within. Verse 3 says this peace, perfect peace, with sorrows surging round. On Jesus' bosom, naught but peace is found. And he finishes off with this verse, it is enough. Earth's struggles soon shall cease. And the struggles of life come and go for us all and they'll come and go right throughout life. My mother, if she's spared to log, she's, she'll be 88 years of age and she'll still tell you about the struggles that she has in life. Even at 88 years of age, that's the simple reality, isn't it? Our struggles, they'll cease one day though. That's the wonderful thing. And it says, and Jesus calls us to heaven's perfect peace. That'll be an outward peace and it'll be an inward peace. The troubles and the trials and the tribulations of life will go. There'll be no troubles outwardly because we'll be in his presence. There'll be no troubles inwardly because that perfect peace will be perfect in every single sense of the word. You know, but what does this verse mean to you and me today? How can we take it on board? How can we live this out? We can have this perfect peace. We can have this deep down calm. We can have this great confidence. <clears throat> when the storms of life come, this inner peace can be in, within, and it can be completely real. And maybe the storms of life are, are coming around you at the moment. Maybe they're there. Wouldn't it be tremendous just to simply know that perfect peace within 
that peace that passeth all understanding, as the scripture says. The first little thought this morning is, is, that, is that we are to notice what this blessing is that is offered to us. What is this blessing that is offered to you and me? You see, if you turn back to this verse, it's simply described as perfect peace. But what really is perfect peace? How would you truly define it? How would you put it into words? How can you put it simply so that you and I can truly understand what it means? How can you explain it? That's the simple word. And can I say you can explain it and you can't explain it? And that's the simple way of putting it this morning. I can give you a definition, but it, tr it doesn't truly explain what the perfect peace of God is within your heart and life. You've often heard an old saying, it's better felt than tells. You've heard that, haven't you? In other words, you can feel it within your heart and life far better than you can describe it within the heart and life. I was looking at one of the commentaries during the week, and this is what it said. It is a condition of freedom from disturbance within the soul. It's a condition of freedom from disturbance within your soul. Now, your soul is the ever-living part of man. That's the part that will never die. You see, the body decays, and the body one day will go into the grave, but your soul will live on for time, and your soul will live on for eternity. And this is a freedom of disturbance within your very soul within your very inner person, within your very inner man. And folks, that real peace that's there, it's better felt than it's actually told. You see, it's perfect harmony reigning within your soul. You know, the Hebrew word shalom, and we've, we've heard that word many times, has with the idea of, of a soundness of health. That's the idea, really, that it brings. It's a health within that Shalom brings. It's a peace within. It's a healthy peace, in other words, what it's saying here. And one of the descriptions that was given is, is to be filled with perfect peace is to be spiritually healthy and to be free from, from every turmoil and discord and problem within the soul. And it's in that a wonderful place for you and me to be. You see, there's no place within our hearts and within our lives for envy. There's no place within our hearts and lives for jealousy. There's no place within our hearts and lives for a discontented spirit. There's no place, folks, within our heart for the untamed temper that shows up when something rattles us. There's no place in the heart and life for selfishness. There's no place in the heart and life for pride, for intolerance, for criticism, for fear, for anxiety. Because all of those things, when you rhyme them up in a ball, they take away your inner peace, your inner peace. And folks, we all know that for a fact, don't we? Because when jealousy or envy or these other things come into the heart and life, they take away that inner peace. And all they do is bring turmoil with them. You see, all of these things are disturbing factors within the soul. What does God long to give to you and long to give to me? He longs to give a perfect peace. He longs for that harmony within and not heartbreak within. And that's why we go so much to what God has to say. Man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks upon the heart. You know, sometimes you speak to people and people will share so much with you. But unless you get really down beside them and get to sit in the same seat that they sit in, and they open up their heart and their life to you and tell you exactly where they are, sometimes it's very difficult. It's very difficult. And behind every heart, or you've heard me saying, behind every door, there is heartbreak. There is heartbreak. But you know, I've also seen a perfect peace in people's lives. 
even though they were going through situations that were completely heartbroken, there was a perfect peace even in the midst of the storms of life. You know that lovely little portion there in, in Mark 4, where it talks about Jesus out on the, on, the star, on, the, on the sea, and the storm arose. And there in verse 39 of Mark 4, it says, And Jesus arose, and it says he rebuked the wind, and he said unto the sea, Peace be still. And the Bible says, And the wind ceased. And there was a great calm. The wind ceased. And there was a great calm. And sometimes in your life and in my life, the wind can be all around. But in the midst, there's a great calm. You see, it's lovely sometimes when you look at the words are used in Scripture and the words some people use. And I was thinking this morning as I was praying over this sermon and thinking about it, you know, it doesn't just say calm here. It says there's a great calm. It doesn't just say in this verse peace, but it says perfect peace. You know, I was down there, as you all know, I was down in Cork there over the weekend and, and I was speaking at a little fellowship there in, in Bantry on the Sunday morning. And there's a fellow, David Ross, down there. He's, he, he, he's a typical Cork man. He's, he's, he's very, very laid back. And he was giving me directions of how to get there. And you know the way some people give you directions? You, you don't actually know where you're going. But he was very good. You went in through Dunmanway, first of all. And then you went through Dunmanway. You made a wee bit of turning, he says, Mervyn, but keep going for Drimma League. And then you head on through Drimma League. And then he says, you come to, you come to a road that, that winds down. And then he says, Mervyn, it opens up. And I'll never forget his words. He said, it opens up onto the beautiful Bay of Ban. Now, I thought that was some direction to get, wasn't it? And, you know, when I went through Dunmanway and I went through Drimma League and I went down the twisty road and the place just opened up. And, boys, he was right. It was beautiful. It was beautiful. It was beautiful. And the reality is when he says here there'll be a great calm, that's exactly what there will be within our hearts and lives. When he says there will be perfect peace, He's not going to give you a peace that's here when the circumstance of life comes. It'll be gone. That peace will be perfect. Even in the midst of the severest storm, it will be absolutely perfect. You know, in what sense is it perfect? Can I say there's three little things here. It's perfect in, in its quality. This is, this is a piece of great, great quality. And what I want to say here is that it's perfect in the kind of peace it is. You see, this is a true peace. This is a real peace. This is a peace that is worth having. Because it's a peace that stays with you regardless. You see, there is such a thing, can I say, of, of, of a peace that is imperfect. A peace that's here one minute. And it's completely gone. That name. There's no quality to it at all. It's not real. It's not true. It's not good. It's a false peace. But he said the peace that he gives to us is, is a perfect peace. Can I say it? It's the imperfect peace of, of, of ignorance sometimes. You see, people have, can tend to have a, a peace. And, and they imagine that all is going well. All is, all is all right. All is doing okay. That all is rosy in the garden. When sometimes all is not rosy in the garden. You know, they can put on an outward sign of peace. But it's not an inward sign of peace. I remember a man came, came to look at something in our house years and years ago. And I was only a wee fella at the time, so it'll tell you how many years ago that really is. But he had, he, had a lovely, he had a lovely cream Mercedes. Now, nobody had them in that day or nobody would have known what they were. But he came into our yard with this Mercedes. It was absolutely gleaming 
It was perfect. And it had a cream leather interior. I'll never forget. Never seen one of them before. Uh, I've seen a number of them since, but I haven't seen one before. And he came into our yard and he got out absolutely immaculate. Now, you thought he was a multi, multi millionaire. That's the honest truth when he came into our yard at that time. And uh, he looked at what he was looking at and he went. And about two weeks later, we heard he had to sell the car because he had no money. And we heard he had to sell his garage because he had no money. And we heard that he nearly had to sell his house because he had no money. You see, everything looked all right on the outside. But you see, on the inside, it, it was completely wrong. You see, that's what the scripture says, peace, peace, where there is no peace. You see, it's an ignorance because it's not a real peace that's going to stand. It's an outward show, but there's no true peace within. There's the imperfect peace of, of stagnation. And what I mean by that, if you, if you look at a stagnant pool, and if you look at that pool, you know, you don't stir it up. And it looks all right. It's quiet. It's calm. Everything's going completely all right. As far as you're looking at it. But stir it up. That's full of green gunge, isn't it? That's full of slime when you begin to stir it. And underneath, everything underneath comes up. And it wrecks the whole picture. But you know, many people have that type of peace. It looks as if it's okay. On the surface, everything seems to be all right. But when you stir the whole thing up, there's absolutely nothing there. You see, maybe yours is a piece of ignorance that you'd be found out. Maybe yours is a piece of stagnation because the Bible says we'll all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And one day it'll be all stirred up and the reality is there, there'll be no real peace. The third little thought here is the imperfect peace of, of dependence. You see, this is a peace that is, is dependent upon certain things or certain people. You see, this peace depends upon the things that we can gather up in life. You know, we have a great peace once, once we have a good way of living. We have a great peace once we have all the trappings of life. But if they are completely taken away, then what do we have? You know, I was at a prayer meeting on Friday morning. Paul, Paul's away this morning, but he was with Prison Fellowship. And he said a man came in to give his testimony. And he said he had absolutely everything. He said, I had a good business. I had a lovely car. He said, he said, I had a lovely house. He said, I had everything going for me. And he said, I got into drugs and I got into drink. And he said, you know where I found myself? He said, I found myself sleeping in doorways with absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing. You see, the peace was there. He had everything. But then when it was gone, he had absolutely nothing. Sometimes we, we, we depend upon people, don't we? We depend upon people and say, listen, if I only had this person, everything's all right. Some people look to their pastors. I know many don't look to me, but anyway, you'd be better not. But the reality is we look to, pa or we look to other people, and then, then when we let them down, then there's a difficulty, isn't there? The things go, the people go. Where does our inner peace go? That's completely gone, isn't it? You see, a dependence upon other things instead of a dependence upon God. There was someone once said, peace does not dwell in outward things, but it depends within the soul and depends upon God. You see, the peace that he gives is a peace of quality. It's quality. The second little thought here or sorry, quantity. The second little thought here, it's, it's a perfect piece in its, in its quality. That is to say the supply of it is sufficient and it meets your need and it will meet my need exactly. As I said, it says peace, peace. It's a double peace and he longs to give it to you. But where is it? Where is it going to come? It's in its, its quality. And can I say, if you turn forward to Philippians 4 and verse 7, you will see it's a peace of heart 
and it's a peace of mind. And those are the two things where you and I need real peace. We need peace in our hearts and we need peace in our minds. There in Philippians 4 and 7 it says this, And the peace of God which passeth all understanding. What's it going to keep? It's going to keep our hearts. And it's going to keep our minds through Christ Jesus. In other words, listen, he's going to guard our minds in our thinking. You see, the problem sometimes with us and with me anyway is, is that we have a lot of wrong thinking. We have a lot of wrong thinking. We think the wrong thing. We mull over the wrong thing. And what does it do? It takes our peace away. That's why God says, listen, I'll guard your mind. So that the wrong thinking about things is not there. And the right thinking about things is there. Our minds need to be guarded. And then he says, listen, a peace that calms our heart. Wrong feelings. Feelings within the heart that are wrong. That are wrong. So there's going to be a calm. Do you ever, folks, when you start thinking, do you you ever get agitated about things? That's the feeling of the heart, completely agitated. And you know, there's people get worked up and agitated about things within the heart where God says, listen, I want to give you the right thinking within the mind. I want to give you the right feeling within the heart so that you're not going to be anxious. He said, shall keep, shall keep. That's a military term. It's guarding a castle or it's guarding a camp from enemy attack. And he says, I'm going to keep your hearts. I'm going to keep your minds from the enemy attacking it. And then lastly, here's our time is gone. It's the peace of heart and mind, but it's the peace of God. And it's also a peace with God. In Philippians 4 and 7, it says, the peace of God which passeth all understanding. That's the idea of peace in our hearts, peace in our minds, God's peace that he gives to us. But can I say this morning, it's the peace of God, but we'll never have the peace of God unless we're at peace with God. If you want to turn there, turn to Romans 5 and verse 1, and this is what it says. Therefore, being justified By faith, we have peace with God. How do we get that peace? It's only through the Lord Jesus Christ. We have peace with God, but it's only through the Lord Jesus Christ. I wonder this morning, have you made your peace with God? Because the minute we realize that we have sinned and we have done wrong, The minute we realize that we need to ask Christ into our heart and the Lord as our Lord and Savior. And we do that. And Christ comes in. We're at peace with God. (coughs) We're at peace with God. You see, before that, we're not at peace with God. We're we're, We're the enemies of God. We're under the condemnation and the wrath of God because we're not at peace with God. We're not his child. We don't belong to him. That's the simple reality. So we can't be at peace with God. I wonder, have you come as a sinner to him? I wonder this morning, have you asked him into your heart and into your life? And are you at peace with God? Because then the very minute you're at peace with God, then you have the peace of God in your heart. And you have the peace of God in your mind. You know, do you have his wonderful peace in your heart? There in John 14 and 27, it says, My peace I give unto you. Do you have his peace? In the situations of life that are difficult, is his peace real or is it gone? And you know, over ministry, over many years, I've seen people at peace with God and having the peace of God and they allow situations and circumstances to come in and then that peace goes. That peace goes. 
And this is what he says to us here this morning. It will keep us in perfect peace. Because our mind is stayed on him. And we are completely trusting in him. Jesus died.